week on Quality Digest Live. Do you trust technology more than people? Plus, we speak with Subir Chowdhury, author of the new book, The Power of Leo. That and more when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for October 21st, 2011. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richman, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Dirk Ducharme, editor-in-chief of Quality Digest. Well, let's start this week with a definitive statement. Technology is a wonderful thing. Maybe. Possibly. That's pretty definitive, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, this story is actually from uh, one of my favorite authors, Paul Naismith, mm -hmm. Life in a Technocracy, a story that ran last week. Mm -hmm. uh, the subhead here, technology has overcome problems I never knew I had. Who did? Who did? Yeah. Okay, uh, in this story, uh, Paul, as is his way, uh, recounts uh, a little incident that happened to him and his wife. They were mm -hmm. at a, an airport in the United States getting ready to get on a flight to fly back to Scotland for a wedding. And as often happens, uh, their flight was delayed and they're going to have to change flights and scramble and make new connections and all that. And the first thing that Paul noticed, because Paul notices everything, because uh, what? He's a quality guy, He's right? a quality guy. He's He's a, a, it's all about the process, That's man. right. First thing he sees is that everybody dives for their smartphones and laptops. Sure. All right, you gotta get there. I mean, I've seen Chris do this. He's like, oh, immediately, what other flights are available? And, and this, that, and the other. And, and he says, immediately, everybody's faces was lit with the, the glow of their, their screens, right? Of the, yeah, their iPhones, sure. And by the way, I might mention, I've seen this happen. And the, the odd thing about when this happens is that there's like a gate agent, like, you know, 15 feet away, and <laughs> rather than go to the gate agent and say, what do I do now? It's like everybody's diving into their technology. Sure. Right. So he, this gets Paul thinking a little bit, and he's, he, he starts to ponder how locked in we are into our technology, into our, our email and our instant messaging. But more than that, even just the, the gadgets we ha have around the house. We have a refrigerator that talks to us to tell us when our, our water filter uh, needs changing. We have our, our washing machine that tells, that tells us and says, your load is done. Right. We have all these technologies mm -hmm. that basically are, are meant to make life easier but they also disconnect us from, in many ways, the, the real world. Now, the stuff at home, and eh, not so much of a, a, of a big deal, but think of the technologies we use around the office. Email. Email. Perfect. And that was one of the big things that got Paul thinking is he, he was talking about, basically he says, look, I'm not a Luddite, you know, I, I don't have a problem with technology. Technology is grand. I use it all the time. I was one of those people getting on my laptop looking at what, what flights were available. Sure. Um, but it did make him think about how we use this technology even at work. And one of the examples he gives is he says, you know, I decided one day to stop using the phone. And instead, I'm sorry, to stop using, yeah, to stop using the phone and stop using email and just get out onto the shop floor. So what he was talking about is typically what he would do is make, uh, send an email to a shop floor supervisor or he would get on the phone and, you know, maybe call an extension down there. Hey, how are things going? Any problems? So on and so forth get his emails out of the way without ever going to the shop floor. Mm -hmm. Well, once he made this decision that one day, not to make phone calls or use emails, that forced him to do what? To get up. Get up, get off his butt and walk and out. And go, to, go to, meet people. Go meet people. Talk to people. So one thing that happened is when he did that, he immediately ran across a person that had a solution for a problem that they were having. And this person talked to, uh, talked to Paul and said, by the way, I'm so happy you came out here. He says, you know, the last manager we had, all I ever got with him is emails. I never met the man. Sure, never showed his face. Never showed his face. And the thing was, is that by doing this, Paul accomplished several things. He made physical contact with somebody. He was able to shake hands, literally or metaphorically, with somebody who had uh, helped solve a problem, which made that person feel good, put him in contact with Paul. So basically by this, this little idea that I'm going to disconnect myself from tech, this one piece of technology for the day, may have made life a little bit more difficult on the one hand, yeah. but on the other hand, it, it created a situation for him that actually improved the quality of the work life that he had, in, at least in that particular instance. Mm -hmm. Sure. And you know, I mean, what, I don't think what we're saying here is that, we're not at all saying here that technology is, is, is evil or bad. Right. It's a tool. And we keep on coming back to this idea of, of, of use your tools, use all your tools, but don't over-rely on any one tool. You know, I mean, hey, there's been times where <clears throat> you've been, what, 15 feet away from me and I've sent you an email. 
<laughs> or, or, yeah. or, 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 or instant message you yes. about... In our, in our huge Quality <laughs> Digest corporate office, you know, you IM'd me from 15 feet away. It, it happens, <laughs> you know. I've seen teenage girls be, they'll be texting each other. They're standing <laughs> right next to each, each other. other yeah. <laughs> it, it happens, you know. And, and, but the over-reliance is what we're talking about here. You know, you lose... There's a lot of things you lose by not having that the personal interaction. Well, and, and I think, okay, and again, Paul is a quality guy, and I think he's making the connection, even though he doesn't make it overtly there, I know what Paul writes about, it, and I think he is making the connection that even as quality people, we rely too much on the technologies that we have around us, which is, is fine if you're doing statistical analysis, you need to bring up your software and look at it. Although I would argue, I would argue, and, and, and Davis Baldastracci and others have made this, is even when you're talking about something like statistical software, you get so locked into it that you don't get up and ask the big questions, why are we seeing this change in a, a shift in, in our control charts? Sure. We just, we just assume that, uh, as, as Baldastracci would say, we would we'll assume yeah. it's a special cause, but when you go out there and you ask a couple questions, you find out, wait a minute, it wasn't a special cause. They ever actually really changed the process, perhaps for the better. Right. And what you're seeing is a step increase sure. or a step decrease mm -hmm. in, in some change in a control chart. But you'd never know that unless you got off your butt and went out there and talked to somebody. Make it, make it broader. Are you even measuring the right thing? Are you collecting data on the on the right piece? Of, are, are you collecting stuff that really matters for the organization? Right, and you don't know that by asking a question of somebody with email as opposed to walking out there and, and, and looking at it and yeah. seeing what they're actually doing. Say, well, you know, we're measuring all this data, but gosh, you know, we're never using it. Yeah, it doesn't really apply to what you're doing day to day in, in your work. So, yes, it's a forest for the trees kind of an argument here, and, right. and I think what Paul's saying is, is has a lot of validity. Yeah. Definitely, it's a good, so good piece. So interesting story. So, as as uh, always. So I, I would uh, recommend all of you guys to go out there yep. and read Paul Naismith. If you're wondering how to find Paul Ma Naismith, and I want to take a couple minutes just showing you some. If we go to the screenshot here, mm -hmm. if you go to our website and you're having problems finding an article, maybe it's a past article or something, if you go to our website and you go into the top left mm -hmm. corner, you'll okay. see there's a big search mm -hmm. box. There it is. There it is. Just type in, like type in an author name. You might want to find articles by Don Wheeler, so type in Wheeler or type mm -hmm. in Naismith or maybe you partially remember the name of an article. Type in those, those words in there. This is actually a Google search of our site. Mm -hmm. It works really well and if you're looking for specific information on our site, this is a good place to do it. Yep. So. Good. All right. Good old Paul A. Smith. Thank you. And awesome. by the way, uh, just as a reminder, oh, there I am. Um, if you have questions, yes. uh, any want to send any questions to us now, or if you have questions for Subir Chowdhury coming up in a f uh, coming up actually in a, a couple minutes, minutes, yep. Be sure to send your questions to qdl at qualitydigest.com. Yep. Thank you, Dirk. And I was actually just going to uh, remind our our audience out there to, to do that, to, to write to us and let us know. We're going to be talking to Sabir here in a few minutes and we're going to be uh, chatting about his, his new book. As a matter of fact, we'll, I'll, I'll mention it right now. The, the Power of Leo is the name of the new book by Sabir Chowdhury. And, and Sabir is, uh, is, is one of the leading lights in our industry and one of my favorite authors. Sure. Uh, Sabir has, has won a, a number of, uh, of medals and awards uh, within our industry. He's won SME's gold medal. He's also won SAE's, Society of Automotive Engineers, Henry Ford II Distinguished Award for Excellence in Automotive Manufacturing. Uh, he's won ASQ's first Philip Crosby Medal for authoring the most influential book in quality, which was The Power of Six Sigma years back. Now, one of my favorite books from Sabir is The Ice Cream Maker, which came out, uh, again, a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, that was a good book. Great book, and, yeah. and a really interesting read. It's a slender volume, but Sabir has a, uh, has a wonderful light touch with it. It's, yeah. really a, it's really very novelistic, and when you read it, you get caught up in this, in this story of, of, of The Ice Cream Maker, and, and I encourage you to read that one, too. But The Power of Leo is, is the book that we're, we're talking about now, and, and Sabir uh, is, is actually with us, and we're going we're gonna to chat with Sabir about, about this. Uh, and uh, and get a little little deeper into it. So, Sabir, are you with us? Well, uh -oh. thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to have you here. Well, the power of Leo again, your your latest book, and, and Leo. Let's let's make sure everyone understands. Stands for listen, enrich, and optimize. So, how did you come to this idea of of, of Leo, listen, enrich, optimize? How did you develop that as as a concept you wanted to bring forward? Yeah, the main uh, reason, like when I wrote the Ice Cream Maker book, uh, just before the Ice Cream Maker book, I was kind of writing this whole uh, Six Sigma out, as you know, that, you know, I wrote the Power of Six Sigma as well as the Design for Six Sigma book. And one of the uh, thought process, uh, what I had was that 
you know, still the quality is not becoming everybody's business. It's still the quality is not becoming uh, in the organization. It is still becoming just to the quality department. So even with the Six Sigma efforts and everything else, that is still it is led by a few group of people. It's not all the people from the top to bottom. And that kind of inspired me saying that, you know, how can I write a, you know, how can I define quality that anybody at any profession can be, uh, can, can learn and practice quality? Because if someone, if a human being, as a human being, each of us practice quality in everything we do, from a, a school child to all the way to the president of the United States, if we really do that, I think the world will be a better place. And that is the part kind of inspired me that how can I teach quality to a level that anybody can understand, not for the traditional quality people, like traditional uh, quality control people. So that kind of inspired me that, you know, to write that ice cream maker. And when I wrote that ice cream maker, as you said that it, it, it is a kind of in a novel format, anybody can come in and read that book in two hours and know what the listen and reach optimize, what are the three things they should do. Uh, my, my new book, the power of Leo is much more focused on that how is Leo is implemented in all types of companies from a small, tiny little foundation to all the way multi-billion dollar corporation and how it is transforming, um, you know, different types of organizations and involving all the people all the time. That's what this book is all about. Well, let's 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 dive into it a little bit and, and kind of get into the into the meat of, of, of what your book is all about. And let, let's take these kind of one at a time. Let's let's start with listen, which is is where all of these improvement initiatives really should start. Uh, my question to you, what came to me when I was thinking about this, was this idea that well, gosh, you know, why is it that people don't listen more? You know, we all want to be good listeners, but it seems like people and hey, I'm I'm guilty of this. People like to talk more than they they like to listen. What's what what are some of the values, the 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 hidden unlocked values, just in listening and observing that you found from from do, writing this book? Yeah, I think the way I designed this, I, I define the word listen is a little bit differently. Like a uh, if I that has a two components of it. One is called observe, and next step is the understand. The question would be the the if you really are doing a good job on listening. I think what you have to do is that you have to observe the situation. So give you, let me give you an example. Like a lot of the time, you know, as you know, because we traditionally from the quality uh, perspective, you know, especially the Six Sigma professional or quality control professionals, we tend to go there and say, okay, as soon as you talk about the voice of the customer, then you immediately go in and saying, okay, there is a tool called QFD, quality function deployment. And it has a, you know, four house of quality, this, that, and all this technical detail. I'm saying that don't even go there immediately. Rather than what you have to do, you have to observe what the customer is trying to say, either internally customers or the external customers. So let me give you a prime example of the observe. Um, you know, I was, uh, I basically, I was working with one of the uh, automotive client and um, I kind of asked them, I said, you know, why, you know, you have a SUV, very big SUV, why you put that, you know, that button to close the back hood on the center, I said, most of the people, you know, they are not six feet tall. It might be very difficult for them to even press that button to close that hood. So they initially said, no, what do you mean by that? You know, that is the way most of the automotive, you know, most of the SUVs, uh, you know, stuff is there and blah, blah, blah. I said, no, look, let us go to a parking lot and observe when anybody's parking these cars, how they are parking these cars and how they are handling. And, and so I said, we don't ask customers anything, just observe them. So what we did is when we are observing it, there is a, uh, on the, in a parking lot, you know, after uh, maybe two hours, there's a lady came in and, and she basically, uh, you know, had a grocery store and everything and, and uh, you know, dump everything on the back of the car. And then before she closed it, what she was doing, she's holding her, you know, a stroller of her child and, and, uh, is still struggling how to close that from from there. And then she was talking something, we cannot listen because we were observing it. From that experience, the engineers of this automotive client truly understood, yes, customer is struggling and they should not struggle. So from there, the innovation came. Now they, are put it, they decided to put that, um, you know, that uh, button to close that hood on the side of the car, which is much more easier for the customer to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason I give you that example, because then you can see that once you 
observe anything you are doing once you're observing it then you understand it that indirectly you are listening to the customer. Sabir, so, this is this is Dirk. So, I mean, actually, that, that's an interesting uh, little case study. Can you actually follow that up uh, by by any way in uh, by your, your next step, the enrich? Yep. I mean, in, in that example you just gave, what would be the the enrich aspect of that? Okay, and enrich aspect of that is that how you make sure once you understand that how you think that you have to you know enrich also has a two step is called explore and discover. That means you have to based on the information you have gathered you reach out you go especially you go to your frontline employees then the, which is the internal customers as well as to the external customers for the different ideas for the possible solutions or to enrich your product or enrich your process and the way i call it is a much more like the, the way i define the word enrich is like this how many of us every single day when you wake up go in front of the mirror all of us do because we are brushing our tooth like when i were brushing our teeth how many of us step back and take a step back and say, whatever I have done yesterday, I wanted to do it better today. Whatever I have done yesterday, I wanted to better today than yesterday. If you have that mindset, and in, in quality control language, we call it continuous improvement. In, if you have that mindset, that enriched mindset, that whatever I have done, whatever the process I'm working on, is it the best process? Am I really exploring to the detail of that? If you have that mindset, irrespective of what your positions are, then you will, the discovery phase will come. And that's what the enrich, enrich is all about. Well, let's and, the, yeah, and the last phase is, is about the optimizing. Optimizing, right. What I wanted to ask you about was how, did, so, so we've gotten to the point now where we're gonna optimize it. Why do you think so many times or on occasion we, we, we see managers at organizations kind of settle, they settle for less, they really don't optimize the, the data, they may have gathered great data, they may really be hearing and, and listening to what they're doing, they may be enriching the process, but they really don't take it to that final level where they really optimize and really make sure that those, those changes are, are not only going to, to be pushed to their logical conclusion, but are going to be ongoing and we're going to really truly have a continuous improvement initiative. Exactly. See, the thing is that we in America happen to be still uh, very much innovation driven culture mm -hmm. that that is our that is in our blood that we are very good in innovation and obviously you know Steve Jobs passing and everything else you know you you have seen all over the world you know how much they miss an innovator like him but I think at the end of the day if you really think about it who is the leader uh, that truly practiced what I'm talking about listen and reach optimize in my definition believe it or not that even though I didn't consult with him, but he is the one who practiced it is Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at his product, if you think about did he listen to the customer, did he enrich the, the community or the societies by delivering the right product, and did he deliver that product, did he optimize it of each of the function of that product? If you really, within that life cycle of the product. So in his mind, if the iPhone uh, version one or version two or iPad version one is going to life a span of two years, he made sure that it's optimized, it doesn't break within, you know, three years or four years. So he knows that within that time frame, customer would be very happy. So ideally in optimize, I again put it in a two major element. One is called improve, another one is the perfect. So what you have to do is that typically we have a tendency to come to the conclusion as fast as possible and we try to do the product launch or come up with the process. Like for an example, like, like our uh, president of the United States, or you know, with all of his team members and everything, suddenly made a decision. Okay, let's let's spend 800 billion dollars on this stimulus. Boom, economy will go up. It, economy will change. You know, job job will be created. Not necessarily, we, because we didn't take the time to understand that if we do that, what is the consequences? So, the ideally, every one of us we don't have that perfection mentality. We have, uh, you know, if we have that mindset of that perfection. So if you really wanted to do the optimize right, then you have to have that perfection mentality. You have to have that uh, improvement mentality. Once you have those two mindset in the first place, then you can optimize. So ideally, that is the reason one of the things what I'm trying to emphasize, especially this book, and I'm very excited about it because Leo is a quality state of mindset. It is far broader than quality control. And, and the beauty about this, it can be applied from a non, any non-profit organization to a two-man show all the way to a, to a multi-billion dollar corporation. Okay, because so, it is that state of mindset. Hi, Sabir. This, this is Dirk. Um, 
So I, actually, it's, w what you just said was, was interesting because it actually ties into uh, to a couple questions um, uh, we just got in. Um, I mean, my question was going to be, is, is Leo just another, well, sorry to put it this way, but another <laughs> quality management uh, idea du jour? Um, and that's kind of what uh, a couple of these questions coming in are. So let me, let me just throw them at you. Um, sure. This first one comes from uh, Christina. Christina asks, um, please ask Subir if his Leo concept is a useful to tool if we were already pursuing Six Sigma, ISO standards, uh, or we use the Malcolm Baldridge criteria. Yeah, how it all fits together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. does Leo tie into that? Is it something completely Absolutely. separate? Absolutely, see what, no, this is the thing. So I see Leo has a four co cornerstone. And the number one cornerstone is the quality is my responsibility. So that is the number one uh, cornerstone. What I call it is that, when somebody is doing for either Six Sigma, Lean, or or anything, or any other methodology, TQM or Judan principle, anything, it doesn't matter whatever it is, the first thing, the, f the most important element, the reason majority of this deployment failed, they don't have that, majority of the people don't have that mindset. What the Leo is trying to promote is that they every employee, every organization, in, in any organization has to have the first mindset would be quality is my responsibility. Quality is not somebody else's responsibility. So when somebody is doing Six Sigma, typical mentality is, okay, our CEO decided to do Six Sigma. So, and th this is the reason I need to do the project and blah, blah, blah. Nope. What I'm saying in Leo, nope, it starts with you. It starts with me. What can I do? So if the quality is becoming my responsibility, that is in my mind, 70 to 90% of the, like as a minimum, like 70 to 80% of the game if you have that mindset established fast. So, so that is the fast. So, uh, uh, Sabir, is, is kind of what I hear you saying is that the power of Leo is something more that you do on a, on a personal level uh, as part of, Absolutely. as part of a yeah. mindset for pursuing whatever quality type of program you, you have, whether it's Six Sigma or ISO 9000 or, or PDCA or, or whatever. Right, that exactly. It's just a mindset. It is a mindset, but the thing is that in Leo, what we've done is that the other element is that, like typically, like every organization has a different culture, and and one of the beauty in the Leo, what I did is, a lot of the companies, like suppose if you compare a General Motors versus a Henry Ford Hospital, it is a two different organization. Now in company like GM or GE or Chrysler or Ford, any of those companies, those are hardcore big manufacturing giant. You might need a lots of different tool sets on that uh, kind of environment. But if you go to a hospital, you may not need maybe 50% or 60% of the Six Sigma tool sets may not have a, any application in the hospital setting. So why you wanted to give it to them, those tools, rather than, and so Leo's purpose is that every customer, initially what do we do? Any client we go to, we try to listen to them fast, that exactly what the client is trying to achieve. Once we understand that, then we customize the program and we don't teach any tool which they don't have a direct application. One of the complaints, what I've, and you know, you know, I have a big background in Six Sigma and everything, but I'm saying in, even in, within Six Sigma, almost 80% of the lot of those tool sets may not have any application in a nonprofit, maybe, or in, in a, a hospital setting or in a government setting. You may not, so you have to understand the customer, then you customize that what the tool sets are needed to deploy Leo. So, okay. you know, so a Leo deployment is not a cookie cutter. Like in Six Sigma, they have a DMAIC, define, major, analyze, Im improve, and control. So suppose if a, if your organization, if you, if, to answer your question, if, if an organization, somebody already have Six Sigma, somebody already have ISO, and somebody already have Malcolm Balji, all together. Now, they are still saying, Shubir, do you know what? I'm still not getting the highest quality result. I still have the customer complaint. So I will, I will then go to that particular client and find out what are the missing element this client to get the excellency. Then I put that elements and what those those tool sets under the Leo umbrella and then deliver that results to them. That's so so Leo is a methodology. So on the other hand, if another client tomorrow comes in and saying that Shubir, you know, I'm a tiny little hospital and this is my problem, can you really help me to um, you know on, on solving this particular issue? Then I will have a different tool set. So Leo is customized in every 
setting and every customer even within the department it is different so that's why that is all about the customization and we don't want to teach any tool which doesn't have a direct application to that client environment well so uh, uh, yeah I, I I think that's that's a great a great uh, uh, final statement. We we actually are are you know kind of running out of time, but I, I think that that uh, you know if there's anything anything else that you want to add about Leo before we we uh, we cut away here. Uh, all, all, only thing I I just wanted to uh, like make hundred percent sure that you know at, at least the quality professionals they uh, they have to continuously encourage to. Uh, uh, to the to everybody within the organizations to quality to become the personal business that everybody's personal business rather than not somebody else's job if they have that mindset then obviously irrespective of whatever uh, tool sets they are practicing the organization will get the best benefit well great well thank you Sabir again thank you for joining us on the show today thank we, we encourage anyone else who's got further questions for Sabir send them along we'll Sabir will get those questions out to you you can answer those those users directly and uh, again we appreciate you joining us on the show today well Dirk that was an interesting segment we had with Sabir. Yeah, that was Sabir Chowdhury, author of The Power, the Power of, of Leo. Leo. Great, great book. Exactly. Yes. And um, I don't think there's a link up there right now. But there but will be. We will put a link yep. out to uh, Sabir's, uh, excuse me, uh, Sabir's mm -hmm. website or, or a link out to the book to the if book. people are, are, are interested more in it. Uh, actually, right now, if they click a link, if they click the link below the player, that will take them to um, the story that, uh, the review of Leo that, uh, that no, Laurel we, Tennis wrote. Right and I here. believe there may be a link on I there, there to Leo. Yep. So, gotcha. another way to do it. Good. Okay, well, the next story, uh, we kind of wanted to end with this. Um, in the past couple of weeks, uh, we've lost two men who really shaped today's technology. Uh, mm -hmm. Subir mentioned one of them, obviously, um, and that was, that was Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was another person who died this week, and his loss was something that was felt maybe really only by those of us who work in, in the quality field. Um, and this was Bob Galvin, uh, past CEO of Motorola, who died less than a, less than a week after Jobs on uh, October 11th. He was 89 years old. Uh, Galvin is probably best known for bringing Motorola's quality out of the doldrums, uh, in large part by championing a, a burgeoning quality program, which today is known as uh, Six Sigma. Right. Um, hold on one second here. Sorry about that. Um, it's probably known, uh, this program was known as Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. and it is probably safe to say that we wouldn't even know what Six Sigma was today if it wasn't for Galvin willing to take a chance um, on this right, radical idea that was brought to him by Motorola engineer Bill Smith. Uh, this was an idea that Smith had that promised to increase Motorola's quality by more than 1,800 times. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Michael Harry, who worked with Bill Smith, it took months for Smith to get into a meeting with, with Galvin. Uh, you know, Galvin was the CEO of one of the world's largest electronic firms. But he did manage to get in after months of trying, and Smith spent two hours with Galvin. And Harry says that what happened next was quintessential Bob Galvin. Bob said it was an absolutely magnificent presentation that he didn't understand a word of it. Because Bill was techy, you know, talking statistical things and that sort of thing. He said, but Bill said it with such a passion in his eyes. I knew there had to be something to it. So on that alone, those kind of cues from people, their passion, the look in their eye, the tone of their voice, the clarity of their descriptions, Bob would make a leap of faith with them. Make a leap of faith One of with them. I, I love that. Um, I think that says a lot about Galvin, and, and actually this is something that uh, that both Michael Harry and, and Harry Hertz, who we'll hear from in just a little bit, mentioned. I mean, first of all, you know, he spent two hours with an engineer he hardly, if even knew, and, and he listened to him, and based uh, and based on that, according to Harry, uh, mostly on Smith's enthusiasm, um, he was willing to explore the concept more. And you know, in other words, he really got behind his employee's uh, passion. He got behind Bill Smith's passion. He didn't really understand what he was saying, all of it, but he sure. he understood that Bill believed in it, mm -hmm. and that there was something there that made sense to Galvin enough to pursue it. Um, 
Well, you know, after that initial uh, meeting with, with Bill Smith, you know, uh, Six Sigma started to grow. And with Galvin's support, the work done by Smith and Michael Harry, Six Sigma not only helped turn Motorola's quality around, it quickly became a buzzword amongst uh, manufacturers looking to improve. And mm -hmm. es this uh, especially true after Motorola won the Baldrige Award in 1988. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Harry Hertz, head of the uh, Baldrige Co program at NIST, Six Sigma was a key component of Motorola's Baldrige application. And it contributed to uh, Motorola winning the Baldrige. Um, sorry, to Motorola winning the Baldrige mm -hmm. in uh, 1988. Right. One of the technologies, if you will, that they introduced uh, in their Baldrige application at that time, and then shared uh, at the Quest for Excellence conference and in all their sharing activities after that uh, Baldrige award receipt in 1988 was six six. So. Hertz told me that he, he also believes that winning the Baldrige and acknowledging Six Sigma's role in achieving it helped to bring about even uh, more attention to uh, Six Sigma. But you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the things that a person has accomplished, like Bill Galvin mm -hmm. or, or Steve Jobs. Obviously, they accomplished a lot. But the thing I was struck by uh, in this story and why I think this story is important is that if we're to believe the things about Galvin that both Harry Hertz and Michael, Her uh, Michael Harry uh, told me in, in my interviews, then he was the type of manager that we constantly talk about on the show. He was one with vision and one who understands what really drives a company. It's, it's, the, it's the people on the floor, it's their enthusiasm, it's what they get excited about, mm -hmm. and, to, and to hook into that. And um, one thing that, that I think Harry and Hertz emphasized to me was that he was just an all-around supportive mm -hmm. and nice guy. And it, 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 I, my feeling is if he hadn't been that kind of guy, Six Sigma never would have gotten <laughs> off the ground. As, as, as Michael Harry put it, he was, he was a champion's mm -hmm. champion, uh, a leader's leader, and a gentleman's gentleman. Yeah. That was Bob Galvin. Yeah, well, well said. Definitely yeah. well said by, by Michael. And nice tribute by you as well, Dirk. Thank yeah. you. And actually, if, you, if you'd if you like to hear more mm -hmm. of my, my interview with, uh, with Michael Harry, uh, there's also a really including, uh, I've included in it on a, on a link that we'll put up on the website mm -hmm. later, uh, an interesting anecdote about how Galvin once hired a team of archaeologists, <laughs> get this, to go through Motorola's records and to look at Motorola's history from the eye of an, archae oh, of, of an, eye of an archaeologist. And there was a reason for that, yeah. and uh, uh, that'll be included in, in a little uh, uh, audio link that we'll, we'll put up we'll, later. We'll put up there, great. Thank you, yeah. Dirk, and, and we appreciate it. We'll look forward to that. Well, that's our show for this Friday, October 21st. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll be back, of course, next week with another episode of Quality Digest Live on Friday the 28th. And of course, starting on Monday, Another great week of content in QDD, Quality Digest Daily, so look forward to that. Yep. Well, thanks, Dirk. Sure. Thank you, Sabir, for joining us. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Michael Harry and Harry Hertz for, for their contributions in the, the Galvin tribute as well. So that's, right. that's our show. Uh, wish you all a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. All right. So long.